I'm Jenna Siri, a bookseller and associate producer of Poured Over, and today I am so very excited to be joined by Coco Mellers, who is the author of Cleopatra and Frankenstein, which is a book that changed my entire perspective when I read it for the very first time, and she did it again with Blue Sisters. I love this book, and I can't wait for us to talk about it. So thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so, so happy to be here. So I always start with just wanting the authors to give us a little bit about this book, a little synopsis, so we can get underway with talking about all the great things. Yeah, so Blue Sisters is the story. I always like stumble at this moment. I'm like, Blue Sisters is the story of sister. <laughs> In case yes. you didn't get it from the title. Um, so Blue Sisters is the story of three extremely different sisters. There's the eldest sister, Avery, who is a lawyer in London. There's the middle sister, Bonnie, who is a professional boxer turned bouncer living in LA when the novel opens. And then there's the younger sister, Lucky, who is a model living in Paris. And there was also a fourth sister who was the kind of third in the line between Bonnie and Lucky, who has died really sadly of an overdose. And the novel opens on the one year anniversary of her death. So we're sort of, we come right into how these three sisters are navigating life in the wake of this really devastating loss. And the story is really about, it's about grief and it's about family. It's about family shifting in shape. And it's really about falling back in love with life after loss, like how how to find a way to feel joy and hope in the wake of something really sad. And in the case of these sisters, it's by returning to each other, to their family apartment in New York and coming together as a family again, which leads to some like ginormous blowout fights and also I hope some moments of like real, really moving reconciliation and unconditional love. And as I was reading through, I love all three of these women specifically. I wonder if did they come to you sort of fully formed as a package? Did one voice come first or was it sort of like, no, I know all of them? This was actually a very different experience to writing Cleopatra and Frankenstein, which I did seven different perspectives. And some of those perspectives I really knew. And some of them took like years for me to get. This, the three sisters, because I write from all three of them, it's a kind of triptych model. So it goes like Avery, Bonnie, Lucky, Avery, Bonnie, Lucky. I really knew them. Like, I don't, they kind of arrive like babies in a basket on my doorstep. Like, I just like opened my door and I was like, oh, here you are, come on in. But the sister that was really hard to write was Nikki because she's not present in any of the narrative of the book that's like in actual time. And I really wanted her to feel like an absence. I wanted us to love and miss her the same way the sisters did. And that all had to be done through memory. And memory is like, it's really tricky to write because it can be very heavy on the page and it can really interrupt scenes and the kind of propulsion of the present day narrative. So for memory, I kind of had to find scenes that are they're almost like postcard scenes. Like they have to be quick and capture within a nutshell something very telling about this character, Nikki. And so they had to be impactful, but economical. And that was really hard. Like that I really struggled with. It took oh, the whole course of writing the book over those years of like, I had one memory in and I was like, it's not doing enough work. I'm going to take it out. I'm going to try to add a different memory. And so Nikki is the character that was the most elusive for obvious reasons, but I hope now feels like a real presence in the book. That makes sense. I think we've all read those books that had these huge flashback pieces and they can really be, they can like take you out of sort of the action yeah. and the moment. But they do serve such an important purpose, especially in this, when we really need to know Nikki and understand the space that she held in this family. But I think through the lenses of the other sisters, we get a very complete picture of her, though it's not always the same picture from sister to sister. Yeah, and that's something I was like really wanted to explore is that kind of kaleidoscopic vision of one person. It's so true. Like... There's two things that simultaneously exist I found about having siblings is that on the one hand, my sister is the only person on earth who knows what it's like to have my mom and dad. And that is incredibly valuable. Like that's an amazing thing to not feel alone <laughs> with the experience of having these parents. On the other hand, we often have completely different interpretations of the exact same memory or completely different memories from our childhood. So even though we share this experience of our family, at the same time, there's like contradictions and there's conflicting understandings. And that like that desire 
to have someone bear witness or experience something the same as you and then the reality that they don't causes a lot of strife in families. And so I really wanted to explore that, how like three sisters could all remember Nikki differently. And then what overlaps, like what is kind of core to that sister that they all agree on is also, that was like fascinating to me too. I'm always interested in that in any character. Like, is there something that just everyone who knows them would say like, yes, that is them. And for Nikki, it was this kind of, I, I think it was her maternalness and her and her kindness and that kind of like that's she has this very deep femininity that the other sisters really didn't sort of identify within themselves, but really admired in her. And I felt like that was true for all of them, even though they saw other things very differently. As someone who does not have siblings, the experience for me reading this book is very interesting because it sort of does a dual job of making me really wish I had siblings or sisters especially to like share those experiences but there are also moments where I'm like you know what I am just fine exactly that I think is like I love hearing from only children who read these books because like in any book about siblings because I think that's exactly it and like that's what I love about fiction that's what I love about just like the world in general is like it's and and you know it's not but so it's like it can make you lot like there's so much good stuff to having a sibling. There is so much about it that's just like so like I always say there are things that my sister and I have said to each other that should be illegal. Like it is so the way that we fought when we were younger is insane. Like nobody should should have that experience. But and yet, you know, I always say about her, like she's the only person I feel like, and now other than my son, that I would die for that I also want to kill. You know, like. That intensity is really, it makes for very interesting fiction for me because it's very ripe, kind of fertile ground for exploring a relationship, relationships that feel very high stakes. But yeah, I mean, I think to be honest, there's a lot about your life as an only child that was probably a lot easier as a result. It also depends on what kind of parents you have. Like, I think if you like your parents and you're you're an only child, that's great. (laughs) There are definitely moments going through where I was like, I have seen this, you know, represented. It, it, there was really a lot of like, I think like you have a bunch of sisters. It's very easy to be like, is this like a Pride and Prejudice? Like, is this like a Louisa May Alcott? Is this like an, but I'm like, I was thinking Royal Tenenbaums. I was thinking like the most messed up families as I was reading through this. And there, there were some intense moments where I was like, imagine fighting with someone who knows you in that way. <laughs> yes, that was one, I love that you thought Royal Tenenbaums because that was actually one of my like original references for the book. The idea of exceptional and very different siblings existing in one family is unusual and, and compelling to me. You know, like I almost saw the sisters kind of like the Powerpuff Girls where like they each had like their own color, their own city, their own soundtrack. Like they each had their own world so distinct and yet they're part of this, you know, sometimes harmonious unit. Um, and then the fight scenes, like the second half of the book I had originally written and the sisters, you know, they, they come from London, LA and Paris. They all reunite in New York. And then the first draft of the novel I wrote, they all just like get along and are really sweet to each other. And then the second half of the book just kind of like putted along. And my editors were like, yeah, the second half is a little boring. (laughs) But I am so conflict inverse. Like, and my sister and I don't fight anymore. Like we get, we're really close. So I was like, I just want them to be sweet to each other. They've like been through so much. Like they've lost their sister. And it just didn't, it wasn't interesting, first of all. And two, like, it wasn't actually true to the, you know, the whole point of unconditional love is that it has been tested under conditions that are not ideal for love. So if I was going to write about sisters unconditionally loving each other, I had to test that love. So I wrote this fight scene and I basically started it with like, I thought about the worst thing one of them could say to the other. And that that was my sort of mountain top, you know, that was the zenith. And that's, and then I went back to the beginning of the fight and I tried to lead up to that. And what I think is very true of sibling fights, at least in my case with my sister, is like, it starts from something so benign, like so innocuous. In the case of this book, it's like over a Spice Girls t-shirt, like who that t-shirt belonged to. They're all kind of like bickering over it. And yet somehow it trips over this trick wire of childhood trauma and like if it's historical it's hysterical sort of family dynamics into this awful fight you know where the sisters say things to each other that are almost impossible to recover from and yet they do because that's family sometimes 
I loved reading through all that because I was like, you know what? That makes me feel better about some of the things that have happened in my family. And so (laughs) it is really one of those moments, especially a good sibling story. I feel like isn't always well represented in fiction. I think we have a lot of stories of romantic love. We have, and then even fewer stories of friendship. We have stories of parents and children. And there are some big sibling stories, but at the same time, I think it's something that is a different kind of relationship than we see portrayed often. I also like, I really wanted to portray a sibling relationship in a way that was not, like sometimes I find it gets reduced, the sibling relationship to one note which can be a little like saccharine almost. It's just like, and that's why the opening line of the novel, a sister is not a friend. It's a big swing of an opening line because the reader could immediately off the bat be like, that's not true. Like my sister's my friend, you know, like, and, and that's not the point of the line. It's not for everyone to agree with it, but to get you like thinking, you know, like how is a sister or a sibling different than a friend? And for me, I was thinking about the fact like you don't choose each other, you know, there's no choice. Like, my sister's just been part of my life since the day I was born. And there's something about that that's like, that love is sticky to me and it's messy and it's deep and it's entrenched and like, and it's profound and it's beautiful and it's ugly and it's vicious and it's gentle and it's so many things. And I really wanted to write a book that allowed for it to be all of those and didn't just flatline it to like, my sister's my best friend. I love her. You know, it's like, my sister, I do love my sister, but like my relationship with my friends are a lot more consensual because I chose to have them in my life. My relationship with my sister is like, it's a whole other ball game for me. And what really brings that through is these very distinct voices that each sister has. I think so often when we, and the danger in writing so many points of view in a book can be that they each end up sounding very similar to each other, but Avery, Bonnie, and Lucky all sound incredibly different as you were writing them. And we really get a distinct sense from each woman's voice. They're so different to me. Like, I can't imagine. They're so, like, real to me as characters. Like, there's no sense in a way that they are all, like, even though they've all come from me, I don't even feel that way. (laughs) I just feel like they are, like, somehow, like, like, I'm trying to capture them, but they already exist. And I'm glad that you feel that they are different. And they definitely, like, they just have completely different desires, needs, wants, like, and and then they have the, and then actually, and then they have the one thing that's in common, which is this, they want to connect with each other, but no, but none of them know how to go about doing it. And that is the sort of central tension of the novel is like, there's three sisters who desperately long for closeness, and yet they are all very self-destructive in their own ways, all sort of incapable of feeling their feelings and do a lot to get out of their feelings, to wriggle out of the kind of, the sort of necessary discomfort of being alive, that in this case has been really exacerbated by experiencing some like very, very real grief and loss. But what I, I really, I loved writing each of them because they all pulled from different sides of myself. Like Bonnie, I trained with a professional boxer for over a year to be able to write her. And it was really fun to write such a physical character. I'd never done that before. And like, the experience of training and fighting and and trying to capture that on the page. And then Avery, her perfectionism, the difference between the version of herself she projects as this like very type A perfectionist lawyer and her past as a heroin addict and the secret life she's living where she's lying to her spouse, she's lying to her wife, she's lying to her sisters, she's lying to herself. I thought that was like fascinating to explore. And then Lucky... I gave like a lot of my youth to Lucky, like that kind of death defying partying is something that, you know, I got sober when I was 26. So I really identify with that lack of self-regard as a young woman in my 20s of like just, you know, putting myself in such incredibly dangerous situations and, and yet feeling invincible, which is, you know, the purview of youth is to believe you'll never die. And so as a result, basically do death defying things so it was it was fun to write those and it also at times it like was painful to write those scenes with lucky because i was like oh my god <laughs> like go home take care of yourself like have a hot tea and go to bed <laughs> there were many moments through really any of the women's perspectives that i was like reading through my fingers being like oh no this is not this is not the choice you need to make yes very much so that's part of like I would say that's maybe a little bit what I'm always doing as a fiction writer is like if a character has two choices, 
laid in front of them. One of them is the path towards peace, betterment, (laughs) and one is the path towards chaos. I usually am going to have them pick chaos, at least for the first half of the book, because that's what creates, you know, you schedule the drama. That's where the drama comes from. But, and it can be, I think it's, what I hope is that it's a kind of exquisite frustration for the reader. Like, you're like, why would you do that? I would never do that. But that's why we read fiction is to understand, you know, why people behave in ways so vastly different from our own. Like, I'm not interested in writing good people or bad people. That's not I'm interested in writing fallible human beings. And like any of us can look around and see like we are constantly as humans making decisions that are not in our best interest. Like it's part of who we are. It's part of what Freud calls the death drive. So like I that's what I want to explore. Like why did I smoke cigarettes in my youth knowing that was terrible for me? Like what is it about that that drew me? Some of us have it more than others, I will say. But <laughs> my characters tend to have a lot of that drive. <laughs> And it's such an interesting empathy to have because we're reading about these characters who are sometimes making awful decisions or hurting people or doing things that we would never do. And yet we care about them. And we have this urge to either see them do better or to see them, you know, figure it out. And as we're reading, it's just like, oh, please, please, please get it together. My hope always is when reading that, like, and I know that I find this as a reader, is that I am able to cultivate a deeper sense of compassion for myself through reading other characters, like through having empathy and care for other people who do things that are not always great, but loving them anyway, you know? And that's, and I try to have that for myself. It's not about permitting, you know, destructive behavior or cruel behavior, but I don't really write characters that are cruel. Like that's something like, I don't, that's not so I'm not interested in writing people who are like say, sadistic or, or you know in psycho you know in any way pathological I'm interested actually in writing people who desperately want to do better who want to be kind who want to be loving who want to be good and yet find themselves falling short for whatever reason and the bind of that and I I hope always that there is a I don't, I don't want to call it a redemptive arc but an arc of hope in both my books and in the third book I'm working on, I can feel it too, where like what it's because they are able to change. And that is really hopeful for me. It doesn't mean that like everything is resolved by the end of the story, but for Avery, I wanted her to go from a place of dishonesty to honesty and whatever that meant for her. For Bonnie, I wanted her to go from a place of disconnection from her sport, from her love, who's her trainer to connection. And for Lucky, I wanted her to go from a place of addiction to hopefully sobriety and that's the arc for each of them but how they go about getting there and whether or not they successfully do it is like that's that's what I find out by writing the book I often find when I hear people talking about characters and often it is about women and everyone can read for their own desires and needs but so often I hear this you know I didn't like her I didn't like her and I'm like well but I don't know many people in real life who have only ever made the right choice or have only ever made the likable choice. And so to to be able to encounter it in fiction, like you said, to understand more and to bring so much of ourselves to what we're reading and have it reflect back. I mean, that's how we learn these things. I completely agree. I think likability is a real trap for women in general, like in fiction and in all every single area. You know, I think the onus of likability is put on women so much more than men. Like, and especially it's like, you know, so many of our great literary heroes, like Anna Karenina or like Madame Bovary, like are these likable characters, but they're written by men. And like, I don't think anyone, that's not why I read, you know, I don't read to make friends. Although I have to say I have met met many characters in my reading life that I adore and would love to be friends with. But I'm like so many of the most compelling and interesting characters I've ever read I would absolutely never want to be friends with, you know, it's like, that's not the point. I'm still fascinated by them, fascinated by how they work. And I think it's a mixture. Like, I, of course, I also, I understand it. Like, it isn't nice to read a character where I'm just like, oh, I fucking hate you. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm so annoying. Like, I can be both. Like, I think I'm always looking for both. I'm looking for characters that challenge me and frustrate me, but that also... That, that's, that do somehow connect me deeper to myself and to an understanding of human nature. And likability is not the most complex version of that, you know? It's like, we all made the right choices all the time. Like, where would all the interesting stories be? <laughs> exactly. And especially when you 
can then pair those things with a strong voice and with sort of an authorial voice that's like, I know, I trust. Like when I read your work, I trust that you're going to bring me where I need to go with these characters. You know, I'm reading also for that voice, for that sense of like, I I know that there's an arc here. It's not just going to be like painful moment after painful moment. And then the, I close the book and we're done. Yeah, I definitely, I'm not someone who could write that because it's just, it would hurt me too much as the writer. Like, I love my characters. That's the thing. Like, I don't think they're always good. I don't think they're always likable. I really don't. But like, I love them and and I, I make them suffer. That's the truth. Like, I that's just the way the work seems to go and pan out for me. But I want them ultimately to be happy. Like, I, that's what I long for for them. And so there is a kind of like, you know, when you're the author, like, on the one hand, I don't feel in control a lot of the time. Like, I know that a character is really alive when they start to make decisions or come to conclusions that are not what I would have wanted, you know, for the book or for them. And that's when I'm like, okay, great. They have that independence. Like, that's why I don't plot my books in advance ever, because I want... You know, in the end, I, I know the characters much better once I've been working on the book for two years than I do when I've been working on it for two months. So to give them an outline, I give them these emotional arcs that are very broad, you know, but to outline at two months when I don't really know them yet, for me, would do them a disservice because they're going to reveal to me while working on them what's right for them and their storyline. And I like when I'm surprised, like Avery is making the decision to become a mother or not in this novel. And to stay with her wife or not in this novel. And I really wanted her to come to one conclusion. Like, that's what I would have chosen and plotted for the book. It's also what I would have chosen for myself, you know? <laughs> like, and that's not, she came to a different conclusion. She wanted something else. And it's the, her truth. It's the truth of that character. And that's when I felt, I felt like sad writing those scenes. And I also felt like, I felt, it felt free. It felt empowering. I was like, okay, like, this is what she wants. This is her life, you know? And, and my job as the author is to, is to find a way to make it work in the story. It sounds almost like magical or made up to talk about characters like they're real, but they are real to me in the same way that when I read a fictional, any fictional novel, like those, like Little Women, those characters, well, they live inside of me now. They've been, it's like breathing life into the corpse. It's suddenly they're there. They, I live among them. I think most people would agree that read a lot of fiction. I can imagine, do you get people coming up to you and saying like, I, I'm such a Bonnie, I'm such an Avery, you know, and, and putting themselves in there as well. I adore that. Like, I honestly find it so cool and amazing. And many of us, I think, recognize that we're combinations of all these things. Like, you know, this idea of archetypes has always been really fascinating to me. I think within families, there are very clear archetypes that you either can adhere to or push against from the eldest sister archetype of being maternal or taking care of other siblings or being very responsible, I guess, is how I would say it. And then the like middle child of being diplomatic and easygoing and sometimes receding into the background. And then the youngest child of maybe being a little bit spoiled, being this kind of bright star, liking attention, like often being very charismatic, I think youngest kids are. And, and that's true and not true. It's kind of like with horoscopes, you know, it's like, right. it's not as true as you want it to be in many ways. And I, all, I, you know, I love Sex and the City, the show. I loved this idea of the archetypes or the paradigms that existed within those four women, you know? And so it was really fun to write my own version of that, which is like Avery is type A, Bonnie is the diplomat, Lucky is the little rebel. And then they're also not those things. And then part of their journey is in, in fighting against that kind of stereotype of themselves. So it's fun to hear other people be like, I'm so lucky. You know? <laughs> like, I'm like, me too. <laughs> it really brings a lot to the book when we can find ourselves in those characters as well. Even if it's like, I see myself in all three of them because I know all, all of those things. I've had those moments. And it really connects you to those characters and makes it such a joy to get through each moment and being like, well, if they can do it, so can I, right? <laughs> I think so too. I also think it's why fiction readers are so much smarter than everyone else because it's it's, <laughs> it's a space for reflection and we don't have many of them in our day-to-day -day lives often. You know, obviously some people are incredible at meditating and doing all these things, but for a lot of us, like, you know, I wake up, I'm on my phone, I'm on my email, I'm around people, I'm just going, going, going. When I read, I'm able to reflect on myself and understand myself better. I'm able to reflect on my relationships or other people Often I read and I'm thinking about like my husband or my mother and I'm like, oh, that's really, that's a lot like them. Like that kind of reminds me of, and then I'm trying, I'm like, oh, maybe that's why they do that. It's this analytical 
reflective, gentle space for us to kind of muddle through relationships. And and that is, I don't know, I just think that it only can it can only benefit you as a person and make you more self-aware, more aware of others, more compassionate to yourself, more compassionate towards others. It's like I think if the whole world was reading fiction every day, it would just be a very different place. I agree. It also gives us space to, and especially in your work in this book, to approach some difficult topics. You've got grief, you've got relationships with parents, you've got recovery and addiction, um, even with Nikki's like endometriosis, invisible pain, all of these things that perhaps we don't always encounter day to day in our lives. And yet there's some understanding that can be gained from getting new perspectives on it. One of the things that I think about a lot, it usually becomes clearer like once I'm writing, it's not like a thought when I begin, but I think the things that we find really hard to talk about are really good to write about because your reader then has this private dialogue that they're able to have. And sometimes like it can just be too hard for someone to talk about living with endometriosis or, you know, or chronic pain or and or you know they don't or they don't feel safe to talk about the fact they worry they maybe don't have a healthy relationship with alcohol or or that they're you know that they you know have a hard time with their father and their father scared them growing up or any of these things and so those kind of conversations like that's what I want to be writing about that's what I want to be it's a very tender part of the human experience it's soft and like you can't push on it too hard sometimes. And so I think fiction can be a really gentle place to explore some of those. There's something about reading and the privacy of reading that is incredibly freeing, you know, and, and obviously watching films has that too, to some degree, although of course, like traditionally you would watch it in a public place in the cinema, but like this, the things that I have been able to kind of tap into in myself and begin to start to like look at and shine a light on and heal through reading has been kind of miraculous to me. And I, I really hope that I offer that to other readers if they need it. I imagine that the reader responds to some of these things again. I mean, not only just the character you know, piece, but seeing some of these issues portrayed can be really, I don't know, like gratifying. It can be great to see yourself or to see things that you have struggled with represented in a way that is kind and compassionate and expansive rather than sort of just cutting it down into pieces and saying, oh, this is what this is. I hope so. I've actually thought a lot about trigger warnings on books. Like it's something that I haven't come to a conclusion about, to be honest. Like I, my mind is very like open to both sides of the kind of conversation. Like my books don't have trigger warnings, partly because it wasn't something that was ever like brought to my attention by a publisher. Like it's not really standard practice for adult fiction. I think it's more standard for YA at the moment. But I've thought a lot about you know, I I want to write work that is like, that deals with heavy topics, you know, because that's, I deal with those topics in my life, you know, and my friends deal with them, my family deal with them. And so that's what I want to be working on. And I want to offer a cathartic private space for readers to kind of enter into that conversation with themselves and others. But I never, ever want someone to read work at a time that they're either not ready for it or or that it's just, or that it's not actually what they want to be reading about. Like it's not cathartic for them. Like it's just painful or traumatizing or triggering. So I thought a lot about like whether or not I should have warnings. I really love that readers warn each other. Like I think that's a really wonderful thing from Bookstagram and from Goodreads and from readers being able to communicate so much more freely now because of all this online culture that like, so that you know, like, okay, I don't want to read about that. Like, I'm sure I could like that book maybe in 10 years time or five years time, but like now is not the time for me. And I think I'm much more aware of that now than I was for Cleopatra and Frankenstein. Like Blue Sisters, I hope it's pretty, it's a book about death and you just have to read the back copy. So I'm hoping it's fairly obvious that like, if you are someone who has recently, you know, for some, for some person who's experienced loss, you would, might find that that's exactly the book you want to read right now. And it would just feel like a complete warm hug and someone walking alongside you during one of the most difficult and sometimes lonely periods of your life. And for the next person along, it might just feel like a terrible reminder of something they're actually just trying to like put aside for that moment to get through the day. And I, I want to be respectful of like both those readers. I want to invite the right ones in and I want the ones who for them, it's not the best thing for right now to know that it's okay to just keep moving along and pick up 
some like gorgeous romance novel or like fun fantasy book and just disappear into a world of total pleasure and delight if that's what they need right now. And I think that's also something that fiction can really offer us is that balance. For every, you know, story that may have those heavier elements, we also have the stories, like you said, that can sort of transport you somewhere else. And it's about finding both the balance within specific works. Like within Blue Sisters, there are definitely ways I think where this book could have just been so painful, just page after page, but your work is so balanced to connect us also with the love, with the good, and with all those other things. But also, like you said, if it's not for you right now, it's still going to be there if you're ready in the future. That's what I love about books. And I'm glad you said that because I'm always trying in my own work, like I am really interested in my life, in my work to balance like gravity and levity and depth and lightness and grit and glamour. And like Blue Sisters really is a novel that's like so much about joy and like there's party scenes and sex scenes and like getting dressed up scenes and like there's so many moments for me that were like, and there's lots, I hope, a lot of humor between the characters. And there's like moments you can, I always want people to laugh and cry. Like I'm really not interested in just one or just the other. Although I, there are certainly like, for me, it's almost like David Sedaris is like, just laugh. Actually, I don't know. I listened to David Sedaris something the other day and it made me cry. Like, no, he's, he's laughing and cry. He's amazing. But like Heidi Yannikahara, who's like such a phenomenal author, and obviously Little Life is like more, such a touchstone of a novel. That's kind of like just a cry novel, you know? <laughs> like, and I, 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 as much as I love that book and I love her as an author, like I'm trying to write something with a slightly like sprightlier, lighter spirit than that. Like my goal is never to depress people. I want them to think, you know, and I want them to connect with sometimes the harder stuff in life. But I really want people to walk away from the book with a sense of lightness. I think you use the word expansiveness, which I love. Like, I, my, I would be really sad, actually, if what people walked away from the book with, with was a sense of kind of like depletion or like depression of like, oh, womp, womp, you know? <laughs> like, I think Blue Sisters is going to go on my like laugh, cry, definitely book list. My two recommendations on that right now are Blue Sisters and then All Fours by Miranda July. It's like, oh, if you want to laugh, cry, there there you go. I loved that book. Oh my God, that book. Thank God Miranda July exists. <laughs> we just are all so grateful for Miranda July. <laughs> yes. And, and finding that is so reassuring to me as a person because sometimes life is so one one note. You may feel so stuck in one feeling and one moment in your life and to sort of have that reflection of like, nope, I know that it's going to change. And, and I know that inside, but sometimes you need that little push from something else to be like, no, it's it's going. Don't worry. I think so too. And like a place to feel our emotions that feels like somewhat contained and safe is amazing. Like there's a line in Joni Mitchell and the song People Par People's Parties that I love. And it's laughing and crying, you know, it's the same release. And like, we also sometimes just like need a release, you know, like we're emotional beings learning how to live with our feelings and still like function in a capitalist society in which we like have to function for the most part is really tough. You know, like I'm someone who feels very deeply, like I'm, I'm very connected to my emotions. And sometimes like, I just need to take an hour to read a book and like have a place where I can feel them and then close the book and then like go about my life. And it just is like, I'm so grateful to have that space to do that because I think like not feeling our emotions and not excavating that side of ourselves leads to like so many issues later down the line. Absolutely. And since we, we've we mentioned your uh, your moments when you can take a book and read, I'd love to talk a little bit about some of your literary influences or things that you've really been loving lately. Well, I read all fours, which I'm completely obsessed with. I mm -hmm. definitely know I'm not alone in that. Like that is such a Every now and again, a book, like a book just comes along and it really does. It just like, I don't know, it just punches a hole through the ceiling of what I think a book can do. And that I find so incredibly exciting. I have my kind of like perennial classic novels that I go to again and again. And the three of them are On Beauty by Zadie Smith, which I think is just like a perfect novel. Like it's a very, it's like a classic novel because it's a rewriting of an E.M. Forster story. But it's just, and yet it's also, it feels, you know, it's about a mixed race family in a college town. So it deals with very like, contemporary issues. And it's just her characters throughout studies are just, she's, and she's very, I don't think I cried in that book, but she, she makes me laugh. Oh my God. The other novel for me, just like in terms of like style and like looking at structure is Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan, which obviously won the Pulitzer. So it's not like I'm like, 
I don't think this is like an original <laughs> original book to, to be recommending. I'm like pretty sure the Pulitzer Surprise has put it on many people's radars, but I just love that book structurally. Like I like an experimental novel as much as I like a really classic novel. And then my number one forever, ever novel in terms of just like beautiful prose, like prose that I could just eat like whipped cream with a spoon is Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. It's just for me, it's just a book, it's poetry all the way through. And the storytelling is just phenomenal. The pacing, it's a short novel. I always think it's like if you haven't read a ton of Baldwin, it's like a really good one to start with. And that's just my forever, that's like the book that I would probably, if I was going to be buried in a kind of esophagus <laughs> that's the one I would want in there with me that goes back to that voice I feel like all of those authors are like when I think of them I think so clearly of that voice that can just like carry you through and you're like again you you know you're in good hands when you're reading it it's so true it's voice I kind of always think of it as almost like temperature like those novels are like mm-hmm. a 72 degree and sunny author for me where it's just like they're always the right temperature for what I'm looking for like I can open any page of any book and feel comfortable and safe It's interesting that like, in terms of voice, like finding that voice, like I remember being at a New Yorker Fest talk and someone asked Zadie Smith, and I think it was Hari Kunzru, but they were like, how do you find your voice? And they were both kind of like nonplussed by the question because they were like, you just have it. And like, I felt so bad for the person who asked it because I was like, I had the same question. (laughs) Like, I, I just wasn't brave enough to ask it. And like, finding my own voice as a writer, like the people listening who want to write and can feel like so intimidated. And it's like, how did they know? Like, you know, how I didn't know my own voice for many years as a writer. I had a hard time finding it. I um, was actually when I was in my MFA, my friend Isabella Hamad, who wrote The Parisian and Enter Ghost, which are two like incredible, fantastic novels set in Palestine. I had told her a story about like a date I had gone on and we had been cackling, you know, laughing away as I was telling it. And then I wrote a little bit about it. I wrote a scene and the scene was really serious and like really just kind of like using all this language. I was just like trying so hard to be impressive. And Bella had very kindly and gently said to me, like, why don't you try to write a little bit closer to how you talk, which is funny, you know, and like it has a bit of lightness to it. And it was so freeing to me because I was like, oh, that's voice. Like that's like this kind of stiff sort of formal writing that I was trying to do that's not my voice it turns out I was trying to be someone I'm not so if you're having a hard time finding that that's that's okay because that's part of the process and some authors are really lucky and just have it from birth I think but I wasn't one of them I can even sense like preparing for this and going back and reading Cleopatra and Frankenstein and then reading Blue Sisters sort of back to back I can even sense sort of the the growth in that sort of playfulness and lightness that comes in Blue Sisters that seems like you're stepping into being a little bit even more sure of yourself there in such a great way. I hope so. You know, like, I really hope it's like, you're not like a final product when you're a published author. Like, I hope I'm getting better, you know, or evolving as a writer. And I definitely felt a lot more confident writing Blue Sisters than I did, you know, Cleopatra and Frankenstein. I I love that book. I'm so proud of it. And I, but I started that book when I was 25, which I now think of as like a real baby, you know, like, that's young. I didn't feel young at the time, but like, and I'd never written a book before. I was teaching myself how to write a book with that novel. And so, and I, that's what I love about first novels is they have that kind of vibrancy and that energy of like, I just throw everything at the wall and see if it sticks. Like there's just something that's so, you can't recreate that ever, the feeling of a debut. And I love that. But in Blue Sisters, I had the confidence of thinking like, I've written a novel, like, and I finished it and I sold it. You know, actually, when I started Blue Sisters, I had sold Cleopatra and Frankenstein, famously rejected by everyone. So, but I was like, I have written and finished a novel. I'm not mad at you, sell it. I can't give it away, but hopefully eventually it will sell it. And I kind of was able to come out with a bit more like swagger in my step, which was, which felt really nice. Now with my third book, I'm writing entirely in first person, which I find so difficult and so uncomfortable. I'm like literally crawling on my skin sometimes when I'm writing. I wrote in first person for the Eleanor chapters for Cleopatra and Frankenstein. That's the only first person I've ever done in fiction. If I'm not trying to write the book that I'm afraid I can't write, if I'm not trying to write the book that scares me and like I feel is kind of not my comfort zone and not maybe even in my best skill set, then I'm not, I don't think I'm writing the most interesting book. 
but it's horrible. I'm like, well, why have I done this? <laughs> like, I, I really like writing in third person. I don't know why I didn't just give myself, but I've done two novels like that. I need to try something new. I, I always am like, I want to read something that the author has a passion to do. And sometimes that thing is, what is the challenge? What can I do to push myself a little bit? And I think that we've gotten some really incredible art from people being like, I don't know if I want to do this, but I'm going to do it. I think so too. You know, I remember someone saying to me, like, in life, you often have to choose between boredom and fear. You can keep doing the same thing, but grow bored, or you can start do something new, but be afraid. And most people in life choose boredom. And then, and like, but I want to be someone who chooses fear. So like, I could try to do a third novel that's recreating what I've already done. And I think it would be boring to me, you know, but it's, so I'm going to choose fear. But my God, like, Oh, it's hard. It's hard feeling that, you know, and like a lot of us, a lot of life is learning how to live in sobriety. They often say like, you're either in faith or you're in fear. I have found that to be too binary. Like part of the faith is doing it, even though I'm afraid, like that's the faith It's like the fear doesn't just magically evaporate. As soon as I like put pen to paper, it's that I'm afraid I, and I'm doing it anyway. And that is, that's bravery. That's courage. But it doesn't mean not having the fear, not having the fear at all. For me, that's numbness, you know, that's like what that's what I left when I stopped drinking and doing drugs. It's like part of the reason I drank was to not be afraid. You know, now I live with it all. I live with the fear and the hope and the excitement and the joy, you know, all of it, every single feeling all the time, <laughs> every day until I die. That's the goal. But we get some really incredible art out of it. So that is worth it. I hope so. Yeah, I definitely think so. It's like so much good work comes from sitting in discomfort. That's the kind of, that's the only way to make it. There's a great line actually in Miranda July's All Fours where she has a moment where like she's doing this, you know, arguably quite nuts thing, <laughs> the narrator. <laughs> and she's left her child behind and she has this moment of being like, oh my God, like how she's so uncomfortable and she feels guilty and she feels bad. And she tells herself like, all good art exists on the other side of this feeling you know like I have to feel this feeling to get to the other side and it made it was so freeing when I read that I was like oh my god even you know the narrator isn't Miranda July but I was like even Miranda July who created this narrator feels the way I do sometimes which is like especially as a mother I have to say like guilt is a big part of it and doing something even though you feel guilty is sometimes part of being a parent or being a creative person in general and I think people who come to Blue Sisters will will encounter a lot of that and will sort of be able to put theirs in and get theirs out on that as well. But I have to ask, do you have sort of a, a perfect reader in mind or someone that you really hope finds this book? Do you know, it's funny. It's like it couldn't be singular because I feel like I've met so like I do these tours and I, I get to meet the readers, which is like such a you know, there's two sides of being a writer. There's being a writer and there's being an author. And the writer is a private person that's like alone working. That's, you know, and you're kind of like a child playing, like you're quite like an innocent person, I find, as a writer. The author is like a bit more savvy and like out in the world and dealing with criticism and praise and book sales and numbers and marketing strategies and bookstagram. So sometimes I find being an author quite hard because it's very, it's antithetical to what I need to preserve as a writer, which is that like openness and kind of like almost innocence. But the part about being an author that I just absolutely love, that I could never give up now, is meeting readers. I just love it. Like, I, I cry at every reading during the signing line because I'm so moved and, like, I'm just so touched by what people come up and say. It's And often people are nervous. You know, you've waited in line, you get there, and it's like we all know that feeling when you're like, oh, my God, what do I say now? And you, you had so many ideas of you, you've had read this book, you want to tell the author how you how it made you feel. And it doesn't matter really even actually what they say. It's that they're there and I can feel it's this moment of like, uh, it's divine connection is how I feel. It's like, I feel it as a reader. So I'm completely the same as them. I know it exactly what it's like to read a book and feel so seen and so just loved by a novel, you know, like you love the book, but you feel like the book loves you, you know, you're in a relationship with it. And when I meet that reader and I've met, and there's luckily more than one, yes, you know, I just, the feeling is like, I honestly, it's, it's spiritual. I don't know how else to describe it. it. It's, it's like a kind of taste of God. It's just, it's exactly why we exist on earth as human beings is to connect in that kind of way with another human. 
And I just, I can't, I hope I never, ever have to say goodbye to that feeling. You know, I just love it so much. I love it as the reader and I love it as the writer. I love it on both sides. I think that that's a perfect sentiment. And I can't wait for all the readers of Blue Sisters to find this book, to meet these sisters and to see themselves in them and to go on this journey. So thank you so much, Coco, for being with us today. I can't wait for everyone to get their hands on this book. Thank you so much, Jenna. It was such a wonderful conversation. And thank you to everyone out there who listened. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.